realized that there was a lot of traction with this and people wanted to hear it. And so over the last few years, it's grown into this whole platform, drninaloon.com, which is a lighthouse for several of you all on this call. So many other in the world. The uh, I interviewed everyone. Oh, Go ahead and do that. All right. So as I was saying, um, that blog has grown into a whole different cascade of several different things. Um, one of them being a coaching platform that I host called imgroadmap.com. And of course, the blog has several resources, including the podcast called the IMG Roadmap Podcast. Now, that being said, when I applied into residency, I used the service. I did use Match a Resident as the service to filter programs um, that I was interested in. And that was in 2011, I believe. Um, and the company has grown ever since then. And I've got to meet the founder and I know him personally as a friend. And I feel like this is a service that helped me. And so whenever there's an opportunity to collaborate with them, I'm very willing to do that. Um, that being said, I want you to meet the, uh, one of the key players, one of the key founding players in Match Resident. I'll go ahead and allow him to introduce himself because it's thanks to their generosity that we're able to host this. Um, I really want to tell you though, there'll be a giveaway um, at the end of this Zoom call. Uh, we'll be giving you specifics as to how to enter. But right now, in order to participate in that giveaway, which the giveaway is a specialty list. And so that's one of the service amongst many services that this program offers, Match Resident does, um, where you can get a specialty list of uh, programs that you're potentially eligible for based on different criteria. So we'll be giving away one specialty list at the end of this live session. We'll give you the directions. You'll have to follow my page, drninaloom.com, and you have to follow Match Your Resident. And then you'll have to enter your specialty of interest in that most recent post where, they, um, where you have my picture with the book. You need to go on there and enter your specialty of interest. And you need to go on my page where I have the COVID-19 post collaboration with Match Your Resident and enter your specialty of interest. If you follow these three steps, follow both pages, put in your specialty of interest on our most recent post, we will select one winner to get a free list from Match Your Resident. So you have to participate in this if you want to win this free list. Like I said, it's a list that I use. I, I bought two specialties from Match Your Resident when I was a, a student, and it helped me tremendously in filtering down programs that accepted visas and programs that didn't, and also helped me to filter down programs that um, were going to accept my scores and my specialty. Um, of course, I have a code for it, IMG Roadmap 15. You can get a discount if you use my code. So we'll put that code in the comments. Now, uh, I'll go ahead and allow uh, Zef to introduce himself to us. Let's unmute him, ask to unmute. Thank you, and hello, everybody. As Dr. Nina said, my name is Zef, and I work with Match Residents. I've been working with Match Residents since 2008. So it's been quite a long journey for us. Um, and every year, like Dr. Nina mentioned, we've been growing and growing and trying to really provide the best support that we can for the IMG community, especially. And in this time, it's one of the most important times there is right now. And what we do basically is we provide customized residency lists for applicants based on their applicant profile when you compare it to the minimum requirements of programs. And like Dr. Nina said, we help with things like test scores, visa requirements, time since graduation, all the important cutoffs. And what makes us really powerful in this area is the fact that we contact all these programs directly each and every year by first emailing them, but then we actually have very extensive conversations with the program coordinators over the phone. And I just wanna point out that this year is gonna be especially interesting and vital to help answer all these questions that I'm sure everybody out there has right now, which is, you know, what, what do, you, do you need to see? What are your requirements? You know, are you gonna make exceptions? And you know, we're really looking forward to being able to help provide insight into these questions right now, but as we complete our update, you know, that's gonna be so important and helpful. So, you know, if you give us a call, uh, we provide free guidance and support, and I look forward to you know, helping answer any questions I can right now. 
Thank you so much. Um, the next person we have on is Sarah, and Sarah's helping us moderate um, in the comment section as well. Uh, so guys, let's get right into it. I have some questions that were sent in prior to the start of the call uh, by so many of you who received the email. And I just wanted to go ahead and start with the questions that I have in my hand while, we'll, while we um, wait on you to send in more questions. So the first question that I have is um, regarding, of course, the biggest news in the world of USMLE, which is the fact that um, USMLE Step 2 CS has been postponed for 12 to 18 months. Um, so someone asked this question of, you know, uh, what is your, what are your thoughts regarding US, this, this is from Nita underscore N-A-R-H to say, how does suspension of step two CS affect IMGs getting ECFMG certification? So I actually had my ECFMG certificate somewhere because I wanted to really show it to you guys and say ECFMG certification um, has several requirements, but the key of, of the ECFMG certification process is to have proven that you have successfully completed USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK, Step 2 CS um, prior to uh, starting residency. So that has been the rule for a, since CS became a test, which was sometime in the, in the 90s. And with the changes that have occurred recently due to unforeseen circumstances, and I want us to realize that we, we did not plan to be here. The changes with COVID-19 are universal. They're affecting more than just the USMLE process. So this is a new territory and sometimes that requires grace and it requires patience to wait to see what will happen. But that being said, um, I think when you go on the ECFMG website, they speak to this point and they clearly state that they are working to advocate to determine how they can either relieve the or create alternatives to the US MLE step two remaining a requirement for certification. Because of course, if step two is a requirement for certification and certification is a requirement to be able to participate in the NRMP match, then that means um, as it stands now, we may not be able to get certified. But seeing as this is a universal change, I anticipate that the ECFMG, as they have mentioned on ecfmg.org, you can go on there and read it for yourself, that they are working actively to create an alternative pathway, an alternative situation that still allows them to certify credible IMGs. So that is my answer to that. And you can visit ecfmg.org, go to announcements, and they have a, a post from May 26, that details the three things that they are working actively on as far as advocating. So I anticipate that IMGs will not be discriminated against because of the changes with the, with the regulations as far as suspending or postponing uh, CS at this time. Could I just add one more thing to that, Dr. Yes. Nina? Yeah, so she's exactly right in terms of what the ECFMG has said. And I just want to put out there that I contacted the ECFMG over the phone too to try to get more information and confirmation as to this information. And the person on the phone at least said that they're very hopeful that they're going to be able to create an alternative pathway soon. So, you know, based on their input, you know, and if they're being totally forthcoming and transparent, they sound like they're very positive and hopeful for that outcome. I asked if they expect IMGs to be able to get ECFMG certified for the 2021 match cycle. And they said yes. So that's coming straight from the ECFMG. Now, hopefully, they're able to follow through on that and provide these options or these alternatives. Right. I agree with, I agree with that. And I think that one of the best places for, I think a lot of times, IMGs, we don't realize that we, we can reach out to the ECFMG. Info at ecfmg.org gets you answers. Um, I can't count the number of times I emailed them when I was going through this process, especially with the J1 visa process, I would always email them um, and they're good about responding. So remember that the ECFMGs on your side, they're not against you. 
they are working for you to get you into the U.S. system just as much as you want it. So that should be your point of focus and who you run to for information is the ECFMG. All right, so we have a question in the comment and it says, due to the halt in travels, we were unable to get U.S. clinical experience this year. How much do you think this would hurt people who are seeking competitive specialties like general surgery? So of course, uh, my perspective would be that general surgery is not a virtual experience, right? Like you have to, um, a portion of it could be virtual, like a follow-up visit in the clinic, but the actual learning, which is on an OR table, happens in the operating room. So I understand that not being able to uh, gather the U.S. clinical experience in an, in an operating room is very frustrating because how, do you, how else do you prove that without being present? Um, but I really just want to say this, that what is happening to us as IMGs is happening to everyone. So don't feel like because there is a halt in U.S. clinical experiences that it's only affecting you. Remember that the surgeons who would have been your preceptor were not able to do any kind of procedures unless they were elective for the last six weeks. And just very recently, are they opening up operating rooms to opening up to general cases again, including um, non, you know, urgent, urgent and elective cases? So that being said, the powers that be are well aware of the limitations that you have now. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything. That doesn't mean you can't still be working on your research publication or your poster presentation from the rotation that you had prior to COVID. You can still work on those other aspects of your application, like research and presentations and posters and publications. Those things still make you equally competitive. And you don't need to be in the operating room to do that. So I want you to consider amplifying your application packet using other resources. Um, yeah, I just have one thing to add to that, which is, you know, U.S. clinical experience is a requirement sometimes for programs. And that's one of the things that we're going to be able to determine when we do our update for the criteria. But the five most important things that program directors typically look at in an application are your step score for step one. Your letters of recommendation are extremely important. Your MSPE, your CK score, and your personal statement. So those are all things that you're able to address right now that are, have a huge impact on your application. So just keep in mind that you know there are gonna be these challenges and barriers, but the primary parts of your application, you can still do your best to make as strong as possible. Very correct. I agree with that. I think sometimes it's easy to focus on one thing and forget that there are five other things that that are good and good enough. I, there are IMGs that have matched without U.S. clinical experience. We know that for a fact. Um, so not having U.S. US clinical experience that's beyond your control is not going to automatically kick you out the boat of being invited for interview. Um, so we have some more questions. Uh, we have one that says, uh, regarding the match a resident list and USMLE scores, the programs that appear on my customized list are those programs who accepted IMGs with my board scores. Or is this just that they indicated those minimal scores on the program's pages? So I guess they're asking, this person, is, Clementine is asking, when I pull up my list on match a resident, it's showing a... Um, it's showing a list of programs. Did Match a Resident verify these programs uh, by their website, or are they verifying these programs by the scores of the current residents in that program? So that's a really amazing question. And you know, there's different resources to get program requirements. Um, there's public databases, there are program websites, and then resources like Match Resident, which is basically the oldest in the game. We've been doing it for the longest. And I would say that we've figured out how to do it the best too. And I really mean that because what we do, like I said in the beginning, is we contact each of these programs directly. So we send out several rounds of emails, but then we follow up those emails with in-depth, in-person phone calls with the program coordinator. And that allows us to really determine what their minimum requirements are. 
what's a flexible, flexible preference versus a strict requirement. And what you notice is that things on program websites or Frida tend to be different sometimes than what you might find, find on Match Your Resident. And the reason for that is because we're actually taking the time to dive deeper and really figure out what the true minimum requirements are. So I hope that helps clear up your question. All right, very well. Um, so the next question is, um, we have someone asking about, okay, so the sure to answer that. How would the COVID situation affect visa status? So I'm assuming this person's also a non-US IMG um, and uh, the visas for residency, usually it's a J-1 or an H-1B visa. Um, as of right now, I think that the best thing that you can do is to continue to follow up with your embassy of your, the American embassy in your country of origin or the country in which you carry citizenship because the rules vary. We've seen non-Americans travel into the U.S. over the last few months, even with the pandemic. I have, I know non-Americans that have arrived inside the States. Um, so do not go with the propaganda or the media. I want you to do your own research by contacting the U.S. Embassy in your country. That's the first. Second, you can contact the USCIS or go on their website and determine eligibility if you're already in the States and you're seeking to change your visa status. But that's my response to that. Yeah, one additional just bit of information is that on May, or March 27th, the US Department of State announced that they would again be resuming processing H-1B and J-1 visas. So the US currently says that they're on board or processing of these visas. But like Dr. Nina said, a lot of the restriction, restrictions might be coming from the home countries. So follow her advice and you know that's, that's definitely the best path to start right now. I agree. Um, there's another question from Onenia. She says, Asi aside from volunteering in the medical field during this pandemic, uh, what are examples of other things we could do during this pandemic to boost application? So I just answered that question previously which was, uh, oh, this is different. She's asking uh, outside of volunteering. Other things that you can do um, will be the same things you would normally do to boost your application, which you have to think of it as your ERS application has several different parts. Usually they'll ask for volunteer experience, ask for work experience. So your work, whatever work you're doing now, um, if it's relevant to the pandemic, could play a role. They usually ask for publication, posters, presentations, and such. So if you can get that, that's also a great thing. Um, if you can, um, I think volunteering is probably one of the better things you can do during a time of a crisis. And that's my opinion. Um, we have another question. Are we able to discuss the differences between J1 and H1B visa, which is better limitations ETC? So this is from Sadia Ibrahim, and I just want to, I will definitely be happy to share what I know about both visas. I had both of those visas, and I actually created a free online course on the differences in my experience, really, it's based on my experience, so it's not a legal course per se, but it's on IMG Roadmap. Um, it's called, you could just type into Google and say visa tools for the IMG. Um, on IMG Roadmap or by Dr. Loom or whatever, and you pull it up um, and it details my process with the B1 visa, which is what I started out with doing clinicals, and then J1 and the H1B and even how I got my green card. So I have that on there. It's detailed. You can watch it. It's, it took about 30 minutes to, to, it's 30 minutes of video. So I'm, I can't go into all that detail on this 30 minute call, but I would tell you this, the J1, the biggest thing is that it has a mandatory two year requirement. So you must work in an underserved area for two years. That's why I'm in Kentucky, okay? But um, you must work for two years in an underserved area. But that being said, it, that process can be even up to four years because it's not an immediate, okay? Mine was a three year requirement. And then thereafter you have one year to transition your status. So if you know you don't wanna work in an underserved area, then don't get a J1 because you cannot get out of it. There is nothing that will get you out of working in an underserved area. 
the H-1B visa does not have the clause regarding the underserved requirement. So you can work anywhere in the country at any point in time, anywhere that would offer you employment as an H-1B. So you could be in the middle of downtown someplace with an H-1B. With the J-1, unless you're working at the public health department or you're working in an underserved area within a city, meaning either lower socioeconomic status or high Medicaid patients, it's hard. You have to go to a, uh, what is called a medical or healthcare designated physician shortage area. So those are the big differences between both. Otherwise, I don't see much else of a difference. Um, you can do fellowship on either a J-1 or an H-1B, even though I know most fellowship programs sponsor the J-1. So it doesn't really matter which one you start out with. You can also, um, guys, just go, just go right now <laughs> or after this to Google and type in Visa Tools for the IMG by Dr. Nina Loom. It's a free online course. You can get on there and watch the whole thing. I tell you how I started as a visitor all the way into getting my green card. So I think that's probably the best resource I can offer. Um, we have another question. What are your thoughts on virtual grand rounds and morning reports? Virtual grand rounds are great. I think that it's a good way to learn because ultimately our goal is to learn, right? Um, that's why we're in medical school. So I think that that's a great option. It may not add much to say your portfolio, but you'll be learning in the process. Um, Oh yeah, so Clementine dropped the link to the course in the chat box. So it's imgromab.com slash P, how I handled visa issues. So yeah, that's on there. Let's see if we have any more questions. There's none on the Zoom call. So I'm gonna go ahead and look on Instagram for another question. We have, okay, someone says, um, Please don't forget to mention those who didn't take USMLE and step step one and, to, and step two yet. Um, and the, the question is followed up by asking, I guess that's, that's, that's the question in its entirety. So I guess if you haven't taken step one and step two yet, you have tons of time to prepare as per metric centers continue to work on opening up. So that would be the advantage of um, having not taking the exam is that you have opportunity for, for metric to, uh, to open and so you have more time to study. Um, let's see, we have another one. ITZ underscore L3S says, how, do, how to get clinical experience and research opportunities during this time? So one thing I know for a fact, so like with, uh, we were having this conversation recently in an IMG roadmap private coaching session and um, the this question came up there is a program called FMG portal that is offering telemedicine rotations you can look into that there are several other companies that are offering clerkships we actually had uh, AMO, AM opportunities come by and talk to us about how to get clerkships even in the COVID season so there are opportunities you just have to search and you have to look for them so those are two places that you can go how does the suspension of step two CS affect IMGs? We've already talked about that. Um, when, with, when will US clinical experience be available again? That's a question that is relative because it is available right now. It's just limited. Okay. Um, if, if I, an old graduate, apply with my step one and step two CS score in October, CK in December, Okay, so I think the person's asking, okay, I have step one and step two, but I have CK scheduled for December. So I think that the most important thing is when your CK results will become available. The, your CK results, you should, okay, let me step back. In order to be able to rank programs, you must be ECFMG eligible for certification. Um, so what that means is, by the time February 14th comes around and people and programs are ready to, or the NRMP is ready to have you submit your rank list, ECFMG eligibility for certification or certification is mandatory. So if you don't have your CK scores back then, you'll be missing out. So I always recommend IMG should avoid waiting to take exams until like the last minute because there's always delays with, with score reporting. 
And because there's always delays with school reporting, you don't know what's going to happen. But you may be lucky and you may take it in December and your scores may be out in January. But if they are not available in January and it's February and you still don't have your scores, you may not, you may have to sit out a whole year. I actually know an IMG that I, um, I coached in the past who had this problem, great step one score, great step two CS score, was waiting on CK, um, or maybe it was the reverse, was waiting on CS. And um, I don't remember, but he was missing one score to, to become ECFMG certified. And the deadline came through and he could not participate in NRMP. And he did reach out to NRMP and reached out to uh, the different societies to figure out if there was any exceptions. But you have to either be, even if you don't have your score in your hand, if, if the ECFMG has notation of the fact that you have passed it, you have to be eligible. Um, so you, I'm sorry, even if you don't have your certificate in your hand, but you've passed all three, that means you're eligible and it's just a matter of your certificate coming in the mail. You will be fine to go ahead and do the match. But if you don't have the score, then you're gonna run into trouble for that um, because you wouldn't be able to participate in the match. Anything you wanna add, Jeff? I think you pretty much covered a lot of the most pertinent bits about that. It's a tough question because it really, really helps to have a complete application uh, you know, something that Match Resident does provide is, is whether or not programs require the CS at the time of applying. We don't have that same requirement for the CK. So, you know, if you're going to be applying in December or apply and then have the CK in December, one additional thing I could add would just, you know, try to follow up, at least send programs an email, perhaps letting them know that your application is now complete. It's not guaranteed to necessarily help. But, you know, when you're applying, when you're finishing your application late, every little bit helps. So I guess that's that's one piece of advice to hold on to for that question. I, I agree with that. A lot, a lot of information you can get directly from programs. That is the truth. Um, I, like I said, I know another IMG actually that I also coached last year who failed CS while after, after she submitted her ERAS application and had to retake it, but she had several months because the ERAS was submitted in September. So she had up until December, she retook the exam. And so now was waiting on her repeat results. Now, when she did that, she contacted the programs because she had interviewed, she had about six or seven interviews. Um, and this was without a CS score. Okay, so she got invited for interview without CS scores. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Um, so you could still get invited without a CS score, especially if it's the rule. Um, so she eventually received her CS score at the very last minute before rank list was due for submission and she received the pass. Um, but in the process of waiting for that, she emailed the programs that she had interviewed at already and told them, Hey, I have, um, you know, I have this problem. I failed CS. I've interviewed at your hospital in September and October and November. I'm waiting for my repeat scores. I really intend to match your pro to match into your program. Um, and some programs were very honest with her and told her when you get your score, notify us just so we know. And so that they know to also rank you if they wanted to rank you. And she ended up matching. So um, just a key point for you, don't wait until that because she was very stressed. So you can avoid yourself that stress by planning ahead. Um, so Aldana asks, do you have a video about ERAS application step-by-step? -step? I actually do, um, but I have that on imgroadmap.com. So you have to be participating in our group coaching session to be able to watch me display how to do the ERAS application step-by-step. -step. So yes, I do have that. Um, again, like I mentioned, you can get that through Rashawn is telling you on there. Um, it's imgroadmap.com. Get on there, log in, or sign up, and we'll get you that information. Um, what is your opinion on postdoc research fellowships for competitive specialties? I know a few friends that maybe went into plastic surgery. Uh, not a few. I know one friend that went into plastic surgery who did a postdoc 
research fellowship. Um, so I know that it, it, it helped him. Um, you know, it, it varies. I have a friend that's actually a U.S. grad though, but was in, neuro, in neurological surgery and also did a research fellowship um, and actually did a whole PhD alongside of that. And that definitely helped. Um, but that's because he had a very highly specific niche on brain tumors and it was necessary. So I would not recommend that you do a, a, a research fellowship just to be competitive. You should do a research fellowship because you're interested in a specific thing that needs research uh, or in this, my friend's case, he was interested in neurological surgery with specification um, on brain tumors. And so he did his whole entire PhD around that. So it would be a waste of your time and money to pursue something like that if it's not really what you want to do, because that's not the only thing that can make you competitive or make you match. Um, so yeah, thanks guys. Thanks, Nina. Thanks for Sean for uh, recommending the course. I really put a lot of time into it. I appreciate it. It's on imgroadmap.com. Um, so MRR has a Instagram takeover. So Match Resin has an Instagram takeover every single day. Feel free to tune in and learn from other IMG. I muted myself to add a little bit to the conversation. If you yeah. like. Hi guys, I'm Sarah. So I am managing the social media accounts for Match Resident. And on Instagram, we have takeovers happening every single day uh, from international medical students that are currently in school to graduates. We have experts taking over the stories every single day from different schools and sharing their experience. Uh, stay tuned. And if you'd like to participate, go ahead and send me an email. I'll be adding my email to the comments section. And hopefully we'll have Dr. Nina on our takeover in the future as well. So stay tuned for that. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'll be happy to do that as well in the future. So any other questions? We're almost coming up at our 30 minute mark. Uh, if you have any final questions, please uh, drop them in the, in the box below. I'm also going to go ahead and include, because some of you have asked for this, um, you want to know how to get into my course in the future. I'll send you the information for the summer 2020 boot camp, and it, it starts in July. So I'll put that in the chat box as well. It's hyourclinicals.com. So just go on there and sign up, and I'll keep you informed on any questions that you have. You can email me with any questions that you have regarding um, that. So uh final questions will taking step three and getting a good score at december will help strengthen the application if step one was below average so aldana i think what you're asking is if i take step three and get a good score will that help to strengthen my application if my step one was below average um so what I would say is I've always seen step three, a pass on step three being advantageous for an IMG if they apply into residency. Well, like I said, when I was chief, it was good. It looked good for IMGs to have completed all the exam. Especially if you have a low performance in step one and, and or a failure. The reason I say that is step three is required for you to eventually get your medical license. And when a program is assessing you and you, if you failed an exam before, they're also assessing your likelihood of, of passing the board exams for that specialty. So if you already come in and you've passed step three, then they know that you wouldn't have any trouble getting licensure in that state because that's usually the last requirement for you to obtain licensure to practice in whatever state that you train in. So for IMGs, that first license is very important because it allows you reciprocity for several other states. So if you come in on the front end with a pass on step three, what you're saying is, I'm already prepared. I've done step one, step two, CKCS, step three. I'm optimal. I will not be needing any additional examinations to receive medical licensure in the state that your residency program is located in. So if you had a low score on step one, that relieves the anxiety of the program to think that you will be a person that will graduate residency but can't practice because they can't get a license because it can't pass step three. I hope that helps. Anything you want to add, Zeph? Yeah, the most important thing in addition to all these great points that Dr. Nina just brought up is 
don't take step three unless you're sure you can pass. And the reason being is if you're taking step three, especially to make up for a low score or a failure, and you fail step three, it's not gonna help your application. So just remember that, take it if you feel 100% confident that you're going to perform well on it. Absolutely, because then a failure is not going to make you look any better. But it's exactly. also important to remember that step three is not a requirement to get into residency. A requirement to get into residency is step one, actually for US grads, a lot of them is just step one, step one, step two, and your ECFM certification. But um, in a process of overcompensating, I am just have decided to start taking step three. And then it's made it even more competitive because then you have 10 IMGs applying to this program, hypothetically, it's probably 100. You have 100 IMGs applying to one program. Nine of them have step three and one doesn't. If you are the program director, what are you gonna go for? I mean, think of it. Um, so I think it's not, a, it's, I know it's not a requirement for a fact, it isn't. But if you excel on it, then it could be a bonus. But if you're not ready, don't forcefully take it and fail because then you've just created a whole quagmire of things for you. So last question, do you think due to COVID-19 more programs will conduct virtual interviews? Yes, I think so. If so, how do you think this will impact IMGs as they won't have a chance to shine as they would at an in-person interview? You can shine on a virtual interview. Um, I, on this, you can shine on a virtual interview. Jobs have been doing virtual interviews for years. Um, you can shine on a virtual interview. Like I, I can't, I can't emphasize it anymore. So if you look at the screen, those of you on Zoom, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. I would never show up to a virtual interview in a t-shirt. Sarah is wearing a suit and she has her hair pulled back and she's sitting upright, she's sitting up straight. Zeph has a suit on. If I'm a program director and I'm interviewing 10 people today and I see Zeph's posture and I see Sarah's posture and I see my posture and all this craziness going on behind here in my study, Sarah and Zeph are going to shine out because their posture, they're wearing a suit and a tie by virtue of their appearance alone, they're shining. Because the sort of nerd is gonna be like, this girl, she's over here with this earrings, it's so busy, she's like has a hair tie on her hand, it's just informal, right? But then you turn around and you interview the next doctor that looks like Zeph, in a suit, posture's right, talking straight in the camera, you can shine on an interview. Now that's the first part, appearances. Then the second part is what you say in response to the questions posed of you. You can tell when someone's anxious on camera just as well as you can tell when they're anxious in person. You can also tell when someone does not know the answer to a question on camera as well as you can tell when you talk to them in person. So whether the interview is virtual or in person, you can still stand out. And the first step is debunking that myth that you cannot stand out because it's a virtual interview. Because I do foresee that there may be room for virtual interviews. Another thing to remember, when people don't match and they have to go through the scramble, guess what they do? A lot of them, if not all, are virtual interviews. So don't feel like you can't shine because it's a virtual interview. That's a lie. Um, you can, and you can still bring your best foot forward as an IMG, even on a virtual interview. I actually have an interview coaching program and I know Matcha Resident also has one. So those are resources for you that you can investigate if you need help with that. Um, so we're almost to the end of the, of the Zoom call. Um, the giveaway is going on right now. We're gonna give away one specialty list. Thank you so much to Matcha Resident. Thank you to um, Sarah and thank you to Zeph for coming on and sponsoring this giveaway and sponsoring this whole entire conversation. I'd like to stay in contact with every one of you if you want to. You can find me at drninaloom.com. Um, you can subscribe and get on my email list and I'll give you all the information you want IMG related. 
You can also follow Match Your Resident, and you should, because that's how you're going to participate in this giveaway, is you have to follow them on Instagram, you have to follow me, and you need to put in your specialty of choice in the most recent post on my page, and on Match Your Resident's page, the post with my book, Still MD. Go on there right now and put in your specialty of choice. If you want to get in contact with me, please visit my Instagram, DM me, slide in my DMs. I know a lot of you do. You can slide on in. Um, I answer questions. Fafi, ask for my email. My email is drloom at imgroadmap.com. That's drloom, D-R-L-U-M at imgroadmap.com. Anyone can email me or you can get in my DMs. Um, please stay in contact with us. We want to hear about your progress. We want to help you. Match your resident, like I've mentioned, is something I used um, back in the day. So I definitely support the work that they do. Um, all right. Any final thoughts, Zeph? You want to tell us some additional pointers? Well, I did see one question pop up in the comments, which was asking how Match your resident helps before and during the season. So I'll just briefly answer that. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, we provide customized residency lists which show you the exact minimum requirements for programs. Um, and like I said, that's going to be super important this season. You know, we're going to be getting all the nitty gritty details about the exceptions and the rules that they're going to be following. So honestly, you know, we're looking forward to being able to provide that to you. And every year we have free guidance and support. So feel free to reach out to us, support at matchresident.com or give us a call. You know, we're happy to help everybody out there. So don't, don't feel shy to reach out and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Yes, absolutely. And we have been recording this call so that for those of you who came in a little bit later, you can watch the entire replay and um, we'll make that available to you guys. And it's also, I was streaming simultaneously live on Instagram. So if you don't want to wait for the replay, you could just go on my Instagram and the live will be up for 24 hours. And I think there is an option to save it as an IGTV now. So maybe we'll do that as well. All right. Very well. Thank you all for joining. And um, I have one thing to add to uh, one of the questions. They're asking if Master Resident has a Facebook account. And yes, we do. We have a YouTube, Twitter, as well as Facebook account. And we just opened two new Facebook groups yesterday uh, for the match season for this year, as well as the generic uh, US uh, International Medical uh, Student Association group. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the links as Dr. Nina is wrapping up the beautiful Zoom conversation. Go ahead and follow our uh, Facebook accounts as well as Facebook groups. Thank you everyone for joining in. All right, thank you guys. So the links to our Facebook groups, as well as our Facebook page is in the chat box, along with our email support at matcharesident.com, Dr. Nina's Instagram handle, as well as her uh, direct link to her book, because uh, we got a lot of questions on her book. Please go ahead and check it out in our chat box. Thank you so much for joining again, and um, hope to see everybody soon. Bye.